learned that nine rounds were fired at the RGR scene. You've not read the autopsy report in this case, I presume? No, I have And not. you would not know then what Dr. Masella says about the potential rounds that were fired in this case, correct? No, I do not, you're Would right. it surprise you that it's not nine? It would not. All right. Just a couple of additional follow-up um, questions. My understanding is you actually got involved on April 2nd, a couple days before the search as well? Uh, I, I did do some digital forensics. And you would have dumped uh, Robert Faulkner's cell phone? Robert Faulkner's, yes. So I'm sorry. And you would have given the contents of that information to Special Agent Arends? Yes. And that would have been done before this search on April 4th, correct? Yes. And that had some explicit photographs on there, did it not? Yes. I object, Your Honor, to say it's outside the scope of direct exam. Your Honor, I think we're entitled to ask the officers what they did in this case. Question. Thank you. And it had some explicit pictures on there, correct? Yes. With another woman. Yes. Which was later identified as Lisa Marie Nelson, correct? I don't know who they were identified. Okay. I, that's fair. But you did get it, give that information to Special Agent Arends, correct? I did to follow up on, because that would be relevant, correct? Correct. The supervisory agent from the Bureau of Criminal Investigations here in North Dakota told this jury that all the evidence in this case led him to only one conclusion. Having been involved in this case from the beginning and having provided testimony as to you first responding on scene, working through those surveillance videos, making comparisons of the suspect, finding items at the residence, what did you believe in this case? Foundation speculation. Over. You can go ahead. I, I believe that Chad Isaac killed those four people in, at RJR. I want to bring in my guests for this hour. Joining me in Atlanta, Georgia, trial attorney, president of the National Bar Association and chair for the Rainbow Push Coalition, C.K. Hoffler, and also in Atlanta, Georgia, former district attorney and trial attorney, Walter Gabriel. Thank you both so much. I'm going to start with you, C.K. A lot of evidence stacking up inside this courtroom against the defendant, Chad Isaac. How do you think the jury is taking all of this information in? Well, I think the jury is probably looking at Chad Isaac and wondering how he's responding. He looked a little bit despondent as this evidence that was pretty damning was being presented against him. I think it's particularly persuasive to have casings in a sock, to have some of the evidence, potential evidence in this case, found in odd places, in a refrigerator, in a freezer. Um, and it seems as though the story is being told and linking him little by little to the crimes. And I think that that's very damaging. He looked almost despondent. And I just wanted to say, I am now the immediate past president of the National Bar Association. But again, um, I think this evidence is, is very, very, very damning for um, the defendant in this case. And the jury is probably just looking at him and wondering, what was he thinking? What was he doing? He has a military background. And so it's certainly going through their mind. He would have the capability because of his background and training to, 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 you know, basically commit these crimes and to be as methodical as it appears that he has been. And for most people, it's odd to have casings in a sock. It's very odd. Very, very odd. And congratulations on that president of Bar Association. We're so honored to have you with us, as well as Walter. He's one of our regular favorites as well. Walter, I'm going to go to you now for some of this evidence brought into evidence. It's, I mean, how can you explain away some of the things found in his home? For example, the gloves, they happen to be drying inside his home when police arrived, executed a search warrant, and they smelled of bleach. There's, there's a picture of them right there. How do you explain away that type of evidence here, Walter? No doubt it's bizarre. Um, the jury had to see this evidence and, and wonder to themselves, who does this? Who puts a gun in a freezer, a knife in a dryer? Oh, who has their, their place just uh, blatantly smelling of bleach and, and the casings in the sock is mentioned. Uh, these are things that are going to stick with this jury. And, you know, this airtight, there's no direct evidence, but the circumstantial evidence is just so bizarre and so memorable. Uh, the defense is not going to explain this away. They're going to instead uh, do what they're doing, is, uh, which is uh, do a good job of poking holes in, in different elements of what the state is trying to prove. So while you can't explain this bizarre behavior, uh, you just simply try to poke holes and create reasonable doubt 
uh, through different parts of the case, which I think the defense is doing. They did. In fact, during the testimony about those gloves, CK, the defense on cross-examination really tried to hammer home the point with that particular officer that the officer didn't put in the police report that the house smelled like bleach, but now his testimony is reflecting that it was, everything was bathed in bleach in the home of Chad Isaac. None of the police reports really mention that. Is that something that's affected to really get technical, pick apart an investigation? Well, I think that's really the only thing that the defense can do. I mean, they have to create reasonable doubt. But, you know, attacking the officers, that's a way when there's some glaring errors. And certainly they should have said that the, that the home really, as it turns out, reeked of bleach. But that doesn't erase, you know, casings in a sock, a you know, gun in the refrigerator, a knife, the glove. You know, it's remnant. Well, Honestly, when I hear of gloves, I think of the OJ trial. But it, I think these are these these occurrences are too bizarre, odd, and point to a crime. And remember, the jurors are ordinary people, everyday people, and they're looking at this and saying, "Who does this?" Not anyone who lives, quote unquote, a normal life, whatever that is. And so they're looking at the evidence. And I just think the posture and the demeanor of the defendant sitting at the table, he he looks a little bit bizarre, to be perfectly candid with me, with you. And it, and it sort of fits very nicely into bizarre behavior for a person who in a courtroom is acting a little bizarre. So I think this is not good at yes. all. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, especially when there's no motive here. So that demeanor, behavior, reaction to the testimony inside the courtroom is really helping the prosecution maybe make it a little clear to the jury why someone might do this. Because like you said, odd and bizarre behavior items found in his home. But let's talk about the items found in his workplace. That was also talked about today in the testimony. He, uh, the investigators went to his chiropractic office. And guess what they found in the microwave of the defendant's office. In fact, let's take a listen. What do we see here? Uh, a box and inside the box is a plastic bag that contains uh, 45 caliber ammunition. Is State's Exhibit 701 showing that open box? Yes. What was depicted in these photos? Uh, three boxes of uh, 357 ammunition. Uh, Two of the boxes are full, and there's one box that was missing three rounds, which is depicted in uh, 703. And then moving on to State's Exhibit 704. Were these also found in the microwave? Yes. And what is this photo showing? Uh, two full boxes of 45 caliber ammunition. So, Walter, maybe how persuasive is this to a jury? First of all, it's kind of weird to have shell casings, bullets in your microwave at work. Uh, what do you think the jury may be thinking about that? Well, you know, uh, it, this, this helps the prosecution, in my opinion, because they admittedly don't have a motive that they can point to. Um, but they can point to all this bizarre behavior and all these uh, things that just look like a person who's trying to cover up a crime. Uh, they basically said they think the defendant here uh, committed these murders for fun. And a jury has to, to hear that. And, and you, you look at these things and, and where these items are placed. And, and you just have to wonder about a person who's, who's placing these items in these places. Uh, this, this really hurts because the defendant has no prior criminal history. And so this, this is something that is going to stick with the jury and they're going to have an unfavorable opinion of him when they have close calls on different issues. Oh, yeah. So I, I, I just, I, I think it's going to harm him. Oh, sorry, exactly. You never know with no, you're good, Walter. It's you never know what a jury is going to do, CK, here in this case. And the prosecution and its case in chief really being methodical, taking its time leading up to all this smoking gun evidence. It's been over a week of testimony. These jurors that while they are attentive, taking some notes, it has to be weary to sit through every witness really that has been a part of this case over the last couple of years. Strategically, from a prosecution perspective, how do you make sure that they're really these are really understanding what's important, given that it's been taking them a while to get to some of these findings. 
Well, certainly in a case where you have no direct evidence and you don't have a motive that you can articulate yet, you can argue in closing, but there's been no motive articulated. You have to be methodical. You have to engage the jury. And I think the way of doing that is really just by speaking in plain, just not making it complicated, simplifying what it is, going to so that sense of common sense and decency and what is bizarre or what is not bizarre. And thus far, the actions, what is found at his home, at his workplace, the placement of these things is certainly bizarre. Even if you are an extraordinarily creative person, um, some of the things here are bizarre. And again, his demeanor in the courtroom is not helping, it's hurting him. So the question is going to be, is he going to take the stand? And that's going to be like, um, that's gonna be a real, um, that's going to be very interesting if he decides to take the stand. Oh, it will be. In fact, that's our talk back question. We're going to get to a little bit later in the show. Great preview there, CK. And thank you again, Walter. You're going to be hanging out with me this hour because we have a lot more ahead in the quadruple murder trial, including the chilling testimony of the day as one of the agents in the case says sometimes, like Walter said, people just kill for fun. That's right after this quick break. You're watching Court TV, your front row seat to justice. Now, thinking back to those revolver pieces, were there any other weapons that you found within inside the defendant's residence that you believed were potential murder weapons? Uh, there was a knife that I believe was involved uh, in the murder as well. Where was that knife located? That was located in the wash machine uh, below some clothing. You indicated that you believed it was a murder weapon. What was that based upon? So part of it was the handle of this knife was also orange, uh, the hunter orange that I had spoke of yesterday. Uh, and the other piece that made me believe that this was part of it was the fact that it was in the washer with clothes that I believe were being bleached because there was a towel in there that appeared to be bleached, um, as well as the tip of the knife had a bend in it, uh, which in my training and experience would indicate that it hit something solid. Uh, so I believe that was part of the murder, uh, murder weapon. All right, welcome back to Court TV Live. You just heard from a North Dakota Bureau of Criminal Investigations agent talking about one of the weapons used in the killings of four people being found in the defendant's home. The state says Chad Isaac used this 14-inch knife in the murders of four people at the RJR Management Company. This piece of evidence, along with shell casings, gloves, and clothing found in the defendant's home, could be adding up to a conviction. However, one thing that the state has not been able to tell this jury is why the murders happened. What was the motive? Well, state's attorney Carly Newfield posed that exact question to BCI Special Investigator Arnie Rummel, and his response is our testimony of the day. Special Agent Rummel, was there anything else about the search warrant conducted at the defendant's residence that stood out to you? The, <clears throat> during the search, uh, places where there would have been evidence was bleached. The evidence we found was bleached. Uh, to me, it was apparent that he's trying to destroy the evidence that would connect him to the crime. Um, but the, the mere fact that all the things we were, I mean, many of the things that we were looking for, uh, minus the blood, because it had been bleached, had been located. There's one other thing that I just want to briefly touch on. Given your training and experience in conducting homicide investigations, do you consider motive when investigating? Yes. Do you always find motive? No, we don't always find motive. Uh, we, we like to know the, what the motive is, but we don't necessarily find the motive because some people just kill for fun. And it's... Um, then you never know what the motive is. You, you don't you don't know what's going on in their mind. Um, 
and some people just consider it a challenge. Uh, so, quite frankly, the motive would be that they just have fun doing it, and it's it's hard to prove that. And so sometimes we don't end up with a motive. In this case, did you find a motive as to why the defendant murdered Robert, Bill, Lois, and Adam? No. Despite that, were you still confident that you had found the suspect? Absolutely. Still with me, trial attorney C.K. Hoffler and former district attorney and trial attorney Walter Gabriel. Okay, we, we're talking about motive here, which we mentioned a little bit earlier, but it's an interesting line of questioning from the prosecutor to this investigator. First of all, I'm curious as to why the defense isn't objecting to some speculation here. But on the other hand, I think, well, maybe they think this helps the defense case because there is no motive. So, C.K., what are your thoughts? Well, I think absolutely. They want the jury to hear that this expert, this person is serving as an expert, who's looking at the evidence and giving very, very important testimony for the prosecution case, cannot come up with any motive. But, you know, motive sometimes, in my humble impression, is overrated. It's great when you have motive. It's great when you can put it together. It makes your case nicer and neater. But sometimes it's just not there. But you can always argue in closing what you think the motive is. But what they've done is they've taken away the mystique about motive. And having this, this witness, who I think was quite critical, saying, look, we don't always find motive. Some people do it for game. And introducing that notion, or some people just do it and we never really know why, is very compelling when you have someone who's a seasoned professional who's saying, look, I've looked at hundreds of these cases, and some of them we never find motive. But then he goes back to the knife, the gun, the casings, the bullets, the bleach, the gloves, the clothing, everything but the blood, but there was bleach. All of that building upon why motive is not as important in this case. And I think that's what they're trying to show the jury. Right. But the defense is like, look, there's no motive. Oh, yeah, so. I agree with you 100 percent, CK. But in this case, Walter, it is just so shocking Four people, and it was overkill. It wasn't just executing four people. This was a brutal shooting and stabbing dozens of times. And for a lot of people that we've been talking to here on the ground and locally, it would just be make us a little more comfortable to know why. What are your thoughts, Walter? Well, you know, it, it does look like the murder of a person. This does look like the actions of, per of a person who... Uh, apparently did have fun killing these four people. Uh, the, the, the amount of stabbings per person uh, are just, they're just horrible to think about. And, and what went into these murders are just so gory and terrible um, that the person had to take some sick pleasure in this. Um, but the, the confusing part is why does a person who goes through middle age with no criminal history uh, participate in killings that are this heinous? Uh, after living a life with no criminal arrests to speak of. So that's that's the point that the defense is going to bring out in closing. And these are the uh, these are the issues that the defense are, is raising in different parts of this trial by uh, bringing out different people who have uh, potentially a stronger motive to commit these murders. Uh, so so the motive, uh, it's it's clearly not a necessary part as the prosecution has explained to the jury. Uh, but it is it is a bit problematic that a person with no history, um, no no past to speak of of anything violent, can uh, can carry out these acts. So that's that is a challenge for the for the jury to to accept. It is, and to CK's point, with all the evidence stacking up against him, against him, it makes it a little bit easier for them. But Walter, you made a great point about the defense strategy of pointing to other people people there's a myriad of other people they talked about in opening statements who would have a motive to do away with someone at rjr and ck i got a glimpse at the defense witness list that was filed one of those people being the mistress of the co-owner one of the victims in this case so it seems like the defense case in chief if they choose to put on evidence will focus a lot about these other people who actually did have motive to murder one or all of those people that morning what do you think about that I think that will be compelling, especially when you've got this building evidence that looks really, really suspicious. The knife, the gun, the car, the bullets, the microwave, the glove, the clothing, the bleach. And so they're saying, look here. 
and all these other people not there at all this mountain mountain of evidence that's what i would call it against the defendant and look at all of these other people who had motive and who really really had the ability to do this because it did appear as though the stabbings in particular were so personal stabbing lois 48 times or something like that that's that's that that's a signal of something very personal so i think it's a good strategy but to me it doesn't erase that mountain of evidence the knife the glove the casings casings in odd places the bullets the bleach and clothing things that really point to someone who has committed a crime and who's trying to cover up oh yeah we're going to talk more about that alleged cover-up and speaking CK of a mountain of evidence. We're going to switch gears after this to another big trial. Robert Durst, he's set to retake the stand for the fourth day in a row in his murder trial in California. And from what we've seen so far, is he winning this jury over? We'll break it down for you after this quick break. Don't go anywhere. You're watching Court TV. And describe for the jury uh, how how that worked out? Well, we only knew the talking to the jury makes me nervous. Okay. Welcome back to CORE TV. I'm Chanley Painter and for Michael Ayala this evening and that was Robert Durst testifying in his own defense in the Jinx murder trial for the murder of Susan Berman. Now, Susan Bourbon was found dead in her Los Angeles home in 2000. Prosecutors say Durst shot and killed Berman in order to keep her from telling anyone what may have actually happened to his wife, Kathy Durst. Now, Durst has been on the stand for three days now, despite multiple attempts uh, by the defense asking for a mistrial, saying that Durst's health is too poor for him to testify. But so far, Durst has been quite alert, maintained great stamina, and has really shown an impeccable memory. He's been able to recall dates of many of the events he's testified to so far. And after three days, we have seen the defense attempt to really humanize Robert Durst, having him testify to the death of his mother. And we've even seen him crack a few jokes that really gained some laughter from the courtroom. Now, although during the testimony, Durst did say that his time on the stand has been affecting him by saying that he's always tired. Let's take a listen. You seem you seem to be a little uh, tired. Are you tired? Am I tired? Yes. Sure, I'm always tired. They wake us up at 4 a.m. <laughs> Are you all right to go ahead? I don't know what I'm being asked. Are you okay to go ahead? Shall we continue? So I said she's headed to Grand Central Station in Manhattan. Let and me stop you for a second. So Durst continued his examination and showed the jury some more human moments by testifying about becoming increasingly worried about his wife, Kathy, after she went missing and how he was getting upset that the investigators weren't telling him anything. I was hoping I wouldn't have to show it to anybody. I was hoping that the police would accept me reporting that Kathy Durst, um, um, who's in her fourth year of medical school, is not going to medical school, has not come home, and has not contacted her immediate family. So by this time, were you worried? Yes, I was getting worried. You mentioned that earlier in the week you were more upset uh, than you were worried. Explain that. Well, the way it worked was Kathy had done real bad on a real important exam and she was hoping to retake the 
exam, she thought that was, she, she did not get a better score, she would not be able to intern in the hospitals that she wanted to intern in. So in the early part of the week, did you think that Kathy had voluntarily um, gone off someplace rather than she was missing? Yes, I figured either her sister Mary Hughes or her friend Gilberto Najami was helping Kathy hide out somewhere. But then on Friday, what was your state of mind? Well, then I'm, by the time it got to be Friday, now I'm worried that something's happened to her. Without saying what anybody said, were, were, you keep, were the detectives keeping you abreast or informed of what was going on with the investigation? I heard nothing from the detectives. So, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday before the meeting, had you heard anything from the investigators then? No. What was your state of mind then? I was upset. Still with me, trial attorney C.K. Hoffler and former district attorney and trial attorney Walter Gabriel. Walter, I'll start with you on the sympathy card of Robert Durst. Is he making any headway in maybe coming across as a sympathetic character to these jurors? Well, they're wise to try it. I mean, it's uh, it's there for them to, to use at their disposal. He's phys physically frail. Um, he looks like he's aged tremendously. Uh, and so, and he's he's got his wits about him so he can create these moments to make the jury laugh. But uh, at the end of the day, I, I, I don't think it'll work to the point where it'll have a jury look past uh, the evidence in this case that will ultimately lead to a conviction, in my opinion. Um, it's it's too strong. And he, he's, despite being tired and despite being of age, uh, his memory is sharp. He's holding up well uh, throughout all this testimony. And frankly, in my opinion, the uh, the questioning and the responses look a bit rehearsed. So I, I don't think uh, the intended goal is going to land as they expect. You know, Walter, I sometimes also felt the same way because at times I, I felt the defense attorney maybe queuing up this part of the script and then it would trigger, okay, and then Durst would talk about whatever the topic may have been. I'm interested to hear, CK, your perspective because I'm not really seeing and hearing any like that emotion of, you know, losing your wife and she's, she was missing for a long time. What are your thoughts? I mean, I think it's completely rehearsed, which of course it needs to be. When you have someone of a certain age, and remember they took the position he was way too frail to testify, that he may not live through testimony, which I didn't feel had a lot of credibility, that he wouldn't, his, his psychological and his mental state was so frail that he probably couldn't even do it. Well. When he got on the stand, he made it very clear that he had the lucidity and the clarity of mind to be able to testify and recall issues to perfection. That's something that was rehearsed without a question. He is, he does have some medical challenges visibly. He is a man of a certain age, but we're talking about heinous crimes. And I agree with Walter, all of this to me is a gamble that I believe they shouldn't have taken because he is not, in my impression, being humanized. The fact that he can address and talk about certain things in a dispassionate way, I might add, does not make him more human but because he's going to have to be cross-examined. And that's going to be very interesting. If upon cross-examination, all of a sudden he's too frail to remember, he's just confused and all that, he will completely lose credibility. So I think this was a gamble, very risky, but I don't think it's paying off. Interesting. Thank you so much, CK. And I agree. A little lack of passion on some of those serious issues we've been hearing, but also at times during Durst's testimony, we've been able to see him turn into somewhat of a comedian, really garnering laughter from the entire courtroom. So I want to play for you some of those moments. Mr. Durst, uh, we're, we've moved to a different subject. Mr. DeGaron is going to ask you a different question. Please listen to that question. 
take a pause, make sure you understand it, and then answer the question. All right? You speak very softly, Your Honor. Ah, can you read what I said? Read what he said. Yes. And Your Honor, for the record, I'm, I'm sure everybody has seen it, but I try to um, pause the, what's going on when, when it's appropriate. So watch, watch me when I pause. Oh, I can look at Louie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Either way, speak right into that microphone, all right? <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> Did you wear the wig when you went jogging? A couple of times and I stopped. Why? Because I would get hair in my mouth. How did you keep it on? How did you keep it from falling off? A rope. You may answer. Wigs come with a <laughs> with a rubber liner on the inside, and as long as you don't shake your head too vigorously, the wig tends to stay on. Well, if you're jogging, your head's moving pretty vigorously. That's we're getting yeah, a little bit off, well, off track now. I, I, okay. I was curious about the how the wig. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't think I've seen as much laughing on a direct examination of a defendant or across any time a defendant takes the stand as has Robert Durst during his time there. So I want to get thoughts from CK and Walter about the laughing moments of levity. He's talking about very serious issues. But really, but for what he's charged with here, he seems like he can be kind of a likable guy. CK, CK, I'll get your thoughts first. Well, you know, in that particular um, segment, they were really laughing at the at his attorney, who was saying, "Well, I was kind of curious," and people were laughing about it. There's nothing to laugh about in this case, in my humble impression. So that, for me, fell flat. Um, his attempts, you know, he is in a very difficult position. He's being accused of heinous crimes, of bad behavior, of misconduct, of everything, you name it. But it's very serious. And I know sometimes it is, there is, whenever you can find some humor, you want to connect with the jury and give them a moment of laughter. But it's when talking about the magnitude of the crime, I just feel it's inappropriate. And quite frankly, I thought in that segment, as I said, they were laughing with his defense attorney, not necessarily at him. That is that is a great point. And Walter, I want to get your take. Is it too much? Would you start adjusting strategy or doing anything over this long weekend for the trial when he retakes the stand on Monday? Well, you know, and, and to piggyback on what was discussed, the humor was also centered around the evasive behavior of this defendant um, trying to pose himself as a mute woman. So, you know, I, at the end of the day, I don't think the humor in the, the humanizing of this defendant is going to help. Um, the defense is eventually going to get to the, the meat of this case, and, and Robert Durst is going to, again, try to explain away uh, how his conduct doesn't make him guilty of this crime. And, and who knows, it may work. He testified in the last trial where he was found not guilty. So uh, I could say it's possible here as well. Uh, we'll just have to see how, uh, how it plays out with the defense concluding their direct examination of the defendant. Yeah, Walter, you're right. He dazzled a jury before. He was acquitted of the murder of Morris Black. People say he dazzled those detectives when his wife went missing in 1982. Will he be dazzling these jurors in California? Well, he's still on the stand. Of course, Court TV will bring you that live testimony when he retakes the stand on Monday. But there are two women from Robert Durst's past that really keep coming up in his testimony. His first wife, Kathy. And, of course, Susan Berman, the woman he's on trial for allegedly murdering. So up next, we'll take you inside his testimony about his relationship with Berman. Stay with us. Bob, did you kill Susan Berman? No. Do you know who did? No, I do not. Do you realize you have an absolute right not to testify. 
I am aware of that. Do you want to testify in your own behalf? Yes. You're watching Court TV Live. I'm Chanley Painter. And Robert Durst is on trial for shooting and killing his longtime friend and confidant, Susan Berman, in California. Now, Durst has testified in his own defense for three days, but not much of that has actually been about Susan Berman, but more about Kathy and her disappearance and Durst at a young age. But finally, during yesterday's testimony, we started to get a closer look at Susan Berman's murder, where Durst described his relationship with Susan and calling Susan around the time of the murders and her not being alone. Let's listen to some of that testimony. Were you and Susie ever boyfriend, girlfriend, lovers, or not? No, never, never, never. However, were you close? We were never boyfriend, girlfriend, lovers. But were you close? Yes. But we did not share hotel rooms. Okay. All right, so um, what happened next? You, you Did you conclude the telephone call with uh, Susie? During the telephone call, twice she interrupted him. She said, she told me that the furniture she picked out. What else did she tell me? Oh, and she left the literature on going to Catalina Island, and she chosen which boat to take and stuff like that. And twice, she interrupted our conversation to talk to somebody. Did you hear who she was talking to? Did you hear anybody else? No. Did you hear what she said? No. Okay. All right, what else happened during that conversation, and how did it end? That's pretty much how it ended. Oh, I guess she asked me if I'd made the arrangements with Mike Rashida, the architect, and I said I had, and she said she had made the arrangements with Big Sur in and with her friends from Big Sur. Okay. So then what did you do? I went to sleep. Okay, it's um, you're, It's 11 o'clock or, or thereafter at night, you're at this motel. How long did you stay at the motel? Just overnight. What happened the next morning? I went to the office, gave them cash so that he would not ding my credit card, drank a gallon of, oil, of coffee, and drove to Los Angeles. What route did you take? Say that again. What route did you take from Bakersfield? Route 5. All right. And for those that aren't familiar with it, how did you get into Los Angeles? It's a huge place. Well, I was going to Benedict Canyon. I intended to take Sunset, but I got lost and ended up on Laurel Canyon. All right. And did you... How close is Laurel Canyon to Benedict Canyon? From Laurel Canyon, I was able to get on the Sunset. And from Sunset, I was able to get on Benedict Canyon. And your intent was to do what? to go to Susan's house. Ron, well, I think this is a good time to quit. In two more minutes. Yes. 
Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to pick up Monday at 9 o'clock. Still with me, trial attorney C.K. Hoffler and former district attorney and trial attorney Walter Gabriel. I want to get final thoughts from each of you on the testimony of Robert Durst. That's where it left off. He's going to return Monday to the stand. I'll start with you, C.K., on your thoughts on anything that maybe needs to be adapted over the long weekend when he returns to the stand. I think he's going to have to prepare for a pretty rigorous cross-examination. He's given the other side a lot to work with. Um, he was unequivocal when he said he did not murder Susan Berman. So I think that's, I think all in all, I don't think it was a good thing for him to be on the stand, but he did make a very strong point that he did not murder her, and that is important. But the cross-examination is probably going to be even more interesting, and I would imagine quite rigorous. Oh, I, I bet we're expecting at least a week from Prosecutor Lewin to cross-examine. This is something I'm sure he's living for right now, Walter. What are your thoughts? I completely agree. That, For example, that detail about uh, Susan being interrupted twice while he was on the phone, while she was on the phone with Robert, uh, seems like a convenient detail to remember and add to his testimony here. It'll be interesting to see if cr prosecutors cross-examine him on whether he had shared that with authorities at any point. Um, because the presumption is that person may be the real killer and Robert Durst is a good friend to Susan may have, well, should have one of the authorities to have as much information possible in locating the real killer. Oh, that's a huge point, a little nugget he threw in there to try to explain away his story now, which is he just found Susan Berman's body. He panicked, sent the note, and he's not responsible someone else is at our house. That's a great point, Walter. We shall see when that all happens. I want to thank you, Walter Gabriel, for being with me this hour. And C.K. Hoffler, you're going to stick around with me because we have a lot more to talk about. We'll get you up to speed on the quadruple murder trial of Chad Isaac here in North Dakota. Coming up next, you're watching Court TV, your front row seat to justice. Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Chanley Painter in for Michael Ayala this evening. Thank you so much for being with us. We are in day eight of the quadruple murder trial here in North Dakota. Today, the jury heard from investigators about bullets, gun parts, a knife, and 16 pairs of identical shoes found at the home and business of the defendant. Now, prosecutors say chiropractor and Navy veteran Chad Isaac walked into a property management company in the early morning hours of April 1st, 2019, and shot and stabbed four people to death there. But his defense team says the murders, yes, they are horrible, but Isaac, he's not the man responsible. Yet the evidence, it keeps piling up in the state's case, and the jury today heard about a gun found in a freezer of his home in a container, one of those Tupperware containers, and it had Chad's veg soup marked on the front of it. The story also heard about a knife found in Isaac's home. Now, this is a 14-inch knife, and it was found in the washing machine during the search of his trailer. But that's not all. Also in Chad Isaac's closet in his home, investigators found an odd-looking sock. And in that sock, they found nine shell casings that would have been used in a revolver. When you first found that ammunition and those casings inside of the sock, did the location of them stand out to you? Yes. Why? Because they were hidden in a sock. Now, when you pulled out those items from the sock, what was the first thing that was running through your head? That they were revolver ammunition, which they were looking for a revolver. So I'll piece that together. So let's start with those live rounds that were found inside of the box. What size caliber were they? A 38 special. Are 38 special rounds unique? Uh, these particular rounds, I guess you could say, are unique because they are for a uh, revolver. So what type of weapon could they be used in? They'd be used in a 38 revolver or a 357 revolver. Now, if we move on to the empty cartridges that you found in that sock as well, were you able to determine what type or caliber of ammunition the empty cartridges belonged to? They were 38 specials as well. And just to clarify, those 38 specials could be used in a revolver? Yes. 
How many shell casings were found in that sock? Nine. When you saw that there were nine shell casings, was that number significant to you? Yes, it was. Why? Uh, through the investigation, it was learned that nine rounds were fired at the RGR scene. You have not read the autopsy report in this case, I presume? No, I have And not. you would not know then what Dr. Masella says about the potential rounds that were fired in this case, correct? The, I do not, you're Would right. it surprise you that it's not nine? It would not. All right. Just a couple of additional follow-up um, questions. My understanding is you actually got involved on April 2nd, a couple days before the search as well? Uh, I, I did do some digital forensics. And you would have dumped uh, Robert Faulkner's cell phone? Robert Faulkner's, yes. So I'm sorry. And you would have given the contents of that information to Special Agent Arends? Yes. And that would have been done before this search on April 4th, correct? Yes. And that had some explicit photographs on there, did it not? Yes. I object, Your Honor, this is outside the scope of direct exam. Your Honor, I think we're entitled to ask the officers what they did in this case. Question. Thank you. And it had some explicit pictures on there, correct? Yes. With another woman? Yes. Which was later identified as Lisa Marie Nelson, correct? I don't know who they were identified. Okay. I, that's fair. But you did get it, give that information to Special Agent Arends, correct? I did. To follow up on, because that would be relevant, correct? Correct. The supervisory agent from the Bureau of Criminal Investigations told the jury that all the evidence in this case led him to only one conclusion. There's one other thing that I just want to briefly touch on. Given your training and experience in conducting homicide investigations, do you consider motive when investigating? Yes. Do you always find motive? No, we don't always find motive. Uh, we, we like to know the, what the motive is, but we don't necessarily find the motive because some people just kill for fun. And it's... Um, then you never know what the motive is. You, you don't you don't know what's going on in their mind, um, and some people just consider it a challenge. Uh, so, quite frankly, the motive would be that they just have fun doing it, and it's it's hard to prove that. And so sometimes we don't end up with the motive. In this case, did you find a motive as to why the defendant murdered Robert, Bill, Lois, and Adam? No. Despite that, were you still confident that you had found the suspect? Absolutely. All right, let's bring in my legal experts for this hour. Joining me in Dallas, Texas, former DOJ senior attorney, former federal prosecutor, and federal executive clemency attorney, Tammy Allison. And still with me is trial attorney, former president of the National Bar Association and chair for the Rainbow Push Coalition, C.K. Hoffler. Wow, I'm just so impressed by both of you. It's an honor for you both to be joining me this evening. And welcome to Tammy. Let's talk about this evidence introduced today. One of the things that stood out to me, 16 pairs of identical shoes found inside the chiropractic clinic of Dr. Chad Isaac. Now, we're all women here. We, I'm sure, all love shoes, and I have a lot of shoes. But I don't know that I have 16 identical pairs of the same shoes. Tammy, what are your thoughts on this piece of evidence? Yes, thank you for having me again, Shanley. Um, Listen, as far as the 16 pairs of identical shoes, us ladies know we love our shoes. And sometimes we need, you know, an emergency pair that looks just like the other ones in case they get a little raggedy. However, let's not forget that the defendant here is a doctor of chiropractic. Now, I happen to know a little bit about that because I did do one year of chiropractic school in Houston, Texas, and you're on your feet a lot all day. So I do think that the defense would be able to explain that away, given the fact that the nature of his work as a doctor of chiropractic requires him to stand on his feet all day. So it actually would not be unusual for him to have 16 pairs of the exact uh, same types of shoes. So unless the prosecution is able to connect the dots, and like I always say, make it make sense to the jury, I do think that the defense will be able to explain that away. 
Tammy, as if your resume could not become any longer, you had one year of chiropractic school, excellent. And I had that thought also. I was thinking the same thing. I I go to the chiropractor every now and then. Sometimes maybe they'll prescribe a certain type of shoe that can help your spine that you can wear. But these are $19.99 from Walmart. I believe that was the testimony from the witness this afternoon. So these aren't some special shoes that maybe he would sell or give to patients. They're not in different sizes. These are 16 pair of the same size, $19.99 shoes, according to the witness this afternoon. So again, CK, let me know your thoughts. Well, I, I think I did not go to chiropractic school, but I will defer to Tammy on this, but I do think 16 is just odd because it is consistent with the other oddness, the knife in the washing machine, the gun in the freezer, the, the casings in the socks, the bullets in the microwave, the bleach everywhere, the gloves, the way they were positioned, the, the, the 16 pairs of shoes, all of these things add up to exceptional oddity. And it, it just kind of reeks of someone who has something to hide and who possibly has committed a heinous crime or several crimes. So the explaining away from we're just the shoes, that's one thing because that could just be odd and some people may have a shoe fetish. I know I have a lot of shoes, not 60, maybe three identical pairs if they really look good on me and they fit my feet and nothing hurts. But 16, that's a little much. So. I think this, along with all of the other oddities that we've discussed, would be very, very difficult to explain away if he takes the stand. Because the jury's going to want to know, yeah, what about that? What about that? What about that? If it were just the 16 pair of shoes, I think we might be able to get by. But with all the other stuff, very difficult. Totally agree with you. I think he may be itching to take the stand. He's been reacting inside the courtroom as if he has something he wants to say. We'll have to wait and see. And just for our viewers, there was a expert shoe comparison print done on the shoes, the 16 pairs of shoes and the shoes found in his dryer. And the prosecution brought forth evidence that it would be similar, that it, it could be the same shoe of the print left at the crime scene as the shoe found on the defendant. Do you think that was impactful, Tammy? I do think that it was impactful. I think that that is connecting the dots for the jury to make it make sense. But at the same time, as you mentioned, these are $19.99 rollback prices from Walmart that any other individual could have had. And the fact that there are four victims here and there's one defendant that is being alleged to have uh, conducted all four of these heinous murders. We've heard testimony earlier this week about those witnesses having firearms on them, which presumably that's for protection. So I think I mentioned it before. Um, I think that it's implausible to think that they would just sit back and watch other individuals get stabbed and shot and not try to act on it. So um, I do think that the defense might be able to, again, try to explain that away and also bring up the fact that the number of victims here and the number of defendants, one, it's almost implausible to think that he is responsible for all four of them. But I do think that the prosecution did score there by bringing that up and connecting the dots. I agree with you, Tammy, and I'm going to talk about the search of the truck now because I'm going to steal CK's word of uh, real oddities found <laughs> inside this truck that the defendant was driving that prosecutors say matches the truck scene and all the surveillance video driven by the suspected killer at the time of the murders. Inside this truck, you know, the prosecution doesn't have a motive here, but there is a connection that he rented property from RJ or the RJR managed the property that he rented. So let's take a listen to what they found inside his truck. Anything of evidentiary value found within the wallet itself? Yes, there is an RJR maintenance business card located inside that wallet. Can we see that in the bottom right corner? Yes, you can. If we move to State's Exhibit 742, can we see that image more closely? Yes, this is a closer-up photo of the contents that were recovered. Was it just that there was an RJR business card that was present in Mr. Isaac's wallet that was of note to you? No, on the back side of it, there was a handwritten name, Robert, written on it. 
handwritten name Robert, one of the victims here, Robert Fockler, the co-owner of RJR, maintenance and management, business card found in the trunk. Is that enough of a connection? Does that make any headway here, CK? I think it's important. Again, connecting the dots. You know, this is this is a case that is turning on a lot of circumstantial evidence that is that is building and building and building like a mountain of evidence. And that's just one more piece of evidence that connects him to the victim. So when you write someone's name on the back of the car, presumably that you met them, you know them, you're targeting them something, it really connects the dots. It's telling a story. They're connecting the dots to little bits and pieces of evidence, which is what you do when you don't have a lot of direct evidence. And so I think it is compelling. I think it is important, especially in the context of these heinous crimes. And I do think that that one person, especially given the timeline, could have committed all four of the crimes because I think there were two and then another two based on the timeline. Although it's difficult, but if he has enough training and if he's got, you know, he's shooting and he's stabbing, he certainly could have done it all, I believe. Yes, and CK, to add to your point, because this card is Robert Fockler, the evidence has shown inside this courtroom that he was the target here. This suspected killer waited until... Robert Faulkner arrived. He arrived about a minute and 20 seconds before the suspect left. He was the last one to arrive, and then he was gone. So the suspect was there for know, 20 minutes or so waiting. And I think that goes to the theory here. Like you said, when you have circumstantial evidence, it's that story that you're telling, and you're right. That's one piece of this story. Tammy, I'm going to get your thoughts on if you think the prosecution is making a complete story. They're taking their time doing it, but is it coming together? You know, I, I, I don't think so. <laughs> I want to give them a little something, but I don't think it's coming together, Shanley. I think that the prosecution is getting so wrapped up into the nitty gritty and failing to give the jury the big picture and then working backwards to then focus on these little details of circumstantial evidence for the jury to see that this defendant is responsible. Again, we all know that the standard of proof is beyond a reasonable doubt. I believe that the defense will be able to poke holes into this story and create that doubt. And that doubt is all that is needed for the jury not to convict um, Dr. Isaac here. And as far as that business card, he rented uh, from that property management company. So it wouldn't be odd for him to have the business card. It wouldn't be too odd for him to write the name of an individual that works there um, on the back of the card, especially given the fact that we heard testimony just today that there was no motive. So as far as connecting the dots with the name on the back of the management company in which he resides and there not being any motive, I'm not sure that the prosecution is making headway. Okay, Tammy, you're sounding, you. I know you're a former prosecutor, but now you're kind of sounding like a criminal defense attorney, so I'm going to let C.K. Hoffler respond to your perspective there from the prosecution side. How would you respond to that, C.K., if you were on this case? You know, I see it slightly differently. I think they told a story in the beginning. They're being methodical. They're putting it together, piecing it together bit by bit. I think they have to do more theme building. You know, for every witness, that theme, the theme, the theme, the theme, continuously doing that, they could do more of that. But I do think they're being methodical and meticulous in building the case. And, and I think every little bit helps. Now, if he takes the stand, which I think would be a big, big risk, and he'd be rolling the dice, he's going to have to disabuse the jury of this notion that there's anything odd with about 20 odd things. It's one thing if you've got five little things, you know, here and there. 20. And it's exceptionally odd to have a knife in a freezer. It's exceptionally odd to have, you know, gun casings and socks. It's ex there are a lot of exceptionally odd things that point to things that could lead to murder. And I think they've done a good job in bringing all that together. Is it enough for the jury? I don't know this jury. I'm not looking at this jury. But it makes me wonder. Now, beyond a reasonable doubt is the highest standard, the highest standard. But I'm, it's gonna, I think it's going to be interesting if he takes a stand. I really do. It will be. It will be. And if the defense chooses to put on a case, who will they call? In fact, we're going to talk a little bit more about the defense in this quadruple murder trial. The defense attorney is really using cross-examination to effectively bring up issues. Is it making a difference, though? We're going to take a look at how they're trying to really poke holes in the case against their client right after this quick break. Don't go anywhere. You're watching. Court TV, your front row seat to justice.
you indicated that several of the items were not tested because you didn't think there would be of evidentiary value because they were coming from the defendant. They would obviously have his DNA. But some of the items that were not tested presumably matched the description of the alleged suspect. Isn't that true? Black pants? Black t-shirt? Um, yeah, black pants. Uh, I didn't believe that our suspect was more than likely wearing the same clothes three days later. But if, if the person was or had even washed them, you certainly could send them in for DNA looking for victims' DNA, could you not? Yeah, if they hadn't been washed. You, th you think washing would remove the blood that we heard Dr. Mazzello talk about? I believe it could. And noticing the photographs that were taken of his hands, and I think you talked about the front of his body and the back of his body, there was no, nothing of note there at all, correct? That's correct. You're watching Court TV Live. Thanks for hanging out with us this evening. Now, here in North Dakota, the case against Chad Isaac, the prosecution keeps piling up pieces of evidence, all really appearing to link the defendant to the murderers of four people here in Mandan. And at just about every step of the way, defense attorneys are aggressively crossing the expert law enforcement witnesses trying to raise reasonable doubt. Well, today, a witness testified about entries in an appointment book found at Isaac's chiropractic practice, and they noted an entry about RJR, the business where the killings happened. Uh, it says, I believe it says, stay RJR me. And is there a line in that notation linking it to a specific time slot? Yes, to that circled uh, time slot. And what was that time slot? Um, I think it is four, four thirty to five o'clock. Based off of your training experience, did you find that significant? Um, I mean, it's later in the evening on a Friday, but um, it was obviously was important enough for uh, someone to document that. Can you see that where it says stay RJR me? Yes. Uh, do you know that he has to pay his rent on April 1st to RJR? I did not know that, but okay, that, that, could, that could be a reminder that pay the rent. Yes. Rent is due. And on the far, I guess that would be the week of April 1st. Um, can you show the, the other slide, which was seven 715. He writes on the far right part of the calendar, SEM, which I presume stands for maybe seminar or something. Could but be. It, it says SEM there in any event, right? As yes. Now, the defense also went after the detective who put together the timeline of surveillance videos that show the suspected killer's movements on the mornings of the murders. There's a gap of 59 minutes between the individual walking west from Bill Barth parking lot at 543 on April 1st and the suspect entering RGR at 642 world clock time, correct? That would be correct. Okay. And then we have a critical 40 second gap in the Schmidt auto video, correct? That is correct. Okay. And we have no time or date stamps in the corresponding Midway Lanes videos, correct? That is correct. And we have no Midway Lanes video from the morning of April 1st, correct? That is correct. And we have no Schmidt Auto video from the morning of April 1st, correct? That is correct. And we don't have either of those videos from the morning of March 25th, right? That is correct. And there was a big moment yesterday regarding Isaac's behavior when he was arrested. Several officers had described his behavior as odd, and the defense went after one of those patrol officers. Um, and you talked about or testified to, in your words, the overwhelming show of force. Yes. And that you would expect an individual in that situation to demonstrate, your words, fight or flight characteristics. That is correct. Okay. You also testified there were over 20 officers on the scene, correct? That is correct. Military helicopters in the air, correct? 
that, that is correct. Officers dressed in military gear with assault rifles trained on Chad Isaac. Correct? That is correct. If he would have fought, what would have happened? It, that depends. I mean, we try not to go to deadly force, but if we would have fought, we would have tried to subdue him and try to apprehend him. Fair. If he would have fled, what would have happened? If he would have fled, uh, he would have ran right into the MRAP. Okay. And would it be fair to say that in that situation with 20 or more guns trained on you, military vehicles and helicopters, a person would be scared? Yes. Okay. And may act unusually. Mm -hmm. And you don't typically um, hang out with uh, Mr. Isaac or you didn't in a social setting, right? That is correct. So you've got no real frame of reference to have observed his demeanor prior to this event. That is not correct. Okay. So are these cross-examinations effectively raising reasonable doubt for this jury? Let's talk about it with my guest. I still have with me, of course, Tammy Allison and C.K. Hoffler. C.K., I'll start with you. What do you think? I know a lot of defense attorneys argue their case. Score points on cross. Are they making any headway? I think he asked some very, very good questions of the police officer. But, you know, the last answer was that is not correct. So when he asked him if he had a frame of reference for his odd behavior, any frame of reference, as I understood it, to be able to compare the behavior, he, evidently he does have that. So I think he scored a couple of points. Um, and I was watching the defendant, you know, sort of making gestures like, yeah, well, you know, how was I supposed to act? So I think this defendant wants to speak. I'm still not persuaded because I think all of this evidence is mounting and it, it amounts to odd, suspicious behavior, the kind of behavior that you would expect of someone who's committing a crime in this instance with all of the things, you know, building up. So it's going to be interesting, but I think he scored a couple points, but I wasn't overwhelmed. I think so, too, especially considering that jurors, they don't see the evidence the same way we do as attorneys. We see the strategy. We know what's important, what's not. Here, they're seeing a defense attorney becoming really stern about a point that may not be that important, Tammy Allison, but to a juror, it may seem important. Absolutely. It may seem important to the juror. And I think that they did score here when that law enforcement officer testified that, you know, he has observed some other type of behavior, but it was kind of like a little bit of a cliffhanger, right? So I think that the jury is probably like waiting to hear more about, well, what other kind of behavior has that officer observed before so that they can make it make sense. But as far as the assumption that the defendant would have behaved a certain kind of way, again, this is a doctor of chiropractic. He's a professional. He sat through several board exams. Uh, I think fight or, flight or flight is something that he probably uh, uh, can be explained away by the defense attorneys as far as why his demeanor was the way that it was. I agree with that. So, CK, I want to know what you think the defense has to do to overcome, I'm going to use your phrase, the mountain of evidence of the prosecution. I think they've got to explain some, some things that are just simply odd and bizarre to common people, you know, not people who are, you know, and how, why is there a knife in the freezer? Why is there a knife in the freezer? Um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, not in the freezer, in the washing machine. Why is there a gun in the freezer? I mean, a gun in the freezer. Is there some type of military or some type of training reason why you would have a gun in a freezer? Why do you have casings in socks? You know, back in the day, old school, there's some people who kept money in socks, but casings in socks. Why are bullets in a microwave? I don't know why bullet. Why is there bleach everywhere? Why is the place smelling of bleach? Does he have, is he, does he have a, a certain sort of condition where he is wedded to cleanliness and he wants everything to smell like bleach? The, 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 you know, there are just so many things they've got to explain. The gloves, the clothes, the 16 pairs of identical shoes. We talked about that. I might say five pairs, 16 to me seems excessive. So all of these things put together which just really doesn't, it, it doesn't smell, it doesn't add up, it doesn't smell right. So they've got to explain all of these things. Oh, well, this, and there's explanation. And they can't just explain some of them, they've got to explain all of them because they all stink, okay. in my impression. 
Yeah, they stink like bleach, CK. And she just so happens to have the matching clothes from the surveillance video in his dryer. The orange hooded fleece sweatshirt, black pants, dark shoes that match shoe print possibly. Oh, and also in the dryer we have um, the uh, mask, the reversible ski mask, uh, that bright orange changes to camo. Yeah, the defense is going to have a lot to refute in this case, but we have to switch gears now to the other big trial we are covering for you, the Jinx murder trial out of Los Angeles. Real estate heir Robert Durst will still be on direct examination when he takes the stand Monday morning, but will he have a lot of explaining to do when he is cross-examined? I think he will. We're going to take a look at some of those inconsistencies in his testimony after this quick break. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Chan Lee Painter here in Mandan, North Dakota. But we're going to talk about Robert Durst out of California because he's been on the stand testifying in his own defense for three days. Durst has been testifying through many decades of his life and answered questions about Kathy's disappearance and what life was like living as a mute woman in Texas. But during his testimony, we have found many inconsistencies that will no doubt, be brought up during Prosecutor John Lewin's cross-examination. These inconsistencies are tonight's Court TV close-up. We have highlighted only a few, but first, we heard Durst testify how, in the movie, All Good Things, a fictional biopic about his life, there is a scene where you see Ryan Gosling, who was playing Robert Durst, drag Kathy Durst's character by the hair out of the family party. Now, Durst testified that this was not true and told the jury what really happened. Let's take a listen. In, uh, in that movie that you watched with uh, Yurecki, there's a scene where uh, the person that is supposed to be you grabs the person that's supposed to be Kathy and drags her out of the place in front of her parents. Did that happen that way or not? That was close. I've seen that described three or four different ways by three or four different people. In one scene, I grabbed Kathy by her hair and dragged her out of the house like a caveman or something. Did you do that? No, I did not do that. I did grab Kathy's hat, put it on Kathy's head, grab Kathy's coat, and push her towards the door. But that testimony contradicts what Durst described during the commentary section for the movie. Let's listen to that. After a number of years before I would go to her family's house for a function, I would insist that uh, we agree on how long we're going to stay. Two hours, three hours, four hours, we would always do a negotiation. When the time was up, I was ready to leave. Seeing the story about the hair two different ways. One way, I drag her out of the house by her hair. The other way, I grab her hair and a big chunk comes out. I the one is close enough. All right, still with me, former DOJ senior attorney, former federal prosecutor, and federal executive clemency attorney Tammy Allison, and trial attorney C.K. Hoffler. All right, ladies, let's talk about this first inconsistency. The jury did see the movie All Good Things, the commentary about that. Now they're hearing Robert Durst testify that no, it didn't happen. He didn't actually grab Kathy's hair and pull her out of the house in front of everyone. He testified that he, he grabbed her hat and her coat. Tammy, do you think the juror will make a big deal out of that inconsistency? You know, yes and no. Yesterday I appeared with the judge that presided over the trial out of Galveston, Texas, Judge Chris. And as she stated, he's a liar. Like everybody knows that. But at this point, this trial is about the disappearance of Susan Berman. And while the prosecution is trying to connect the dots with the disappearance of his, dis well, his wife who disappeared, 
we don't know for sure if the jury is going to just solely rely on all of that circumstantial evidence of what happened, what could have happened in the inconsistent statements related to the disappearance of his wife in 1982, 39, 40 years ago, as it relates to the murder of Susan Berman. So yes, while there are many inconsistencies, I do believe that the defense could bring up the fact that this case is about the murder of Susan Berman, not about what happened to his wife, where we've already heard a lot of testimony that there was an, an investigation, uh, whether it was thorough or not, he was not found to be responsible for the disappearance of his wife and her disappearance back in 1982. Great point. And CK, does this also go to his character or propensity for violent behavior that he is a man that could be capable of doing away with his wife, of he admits to dismembering Morris Black, and then also of Susan Berman? Well, it does. Well, you know, to me, it's very clear he's lying. So when you lie about one thing, and this is why I think this is a credibility issue. And it's such a gamble to put a defendant like that on the stand because he's a man of a certain age and he's, you know, escaped uh, convictions before. But in a jury's mind, if you're going to lie about one thing or two things or three things, then you're probably lying about whether or not you killed Susan Berman. And I think that's how jurors think. It's a credibility issue. And by the way, by the way, him saying, well, I didn't grab her by the hair. I grabbed her hat. I grabbed her this. I grabbed, and I grabbed her arm. He's not scoring any points there. He grabbed a woman's arm. He was violent. He has demonstrated, or there's evidence, that he is a violent person. That is consistent with the crime he's being accused of here. So he scored no points with me there. I think it was an incredible risk to put him on the stand. He's contradicting himself. He's not appealing. He's not likable. He's talking this. I, it was I, I would not have done it, but I understand defendants want a chance to explain away things and jurors. You know, sometimes I've seen this with juries. They may not, you know, whether they give you money damages or if it's a criminal case, they may feel that justice comes in different forms. And so while this case may not be about the murder of his first wife, they've put that into this case. They have had him testify about that. So if you're going to have on direct him testify about that, set the record straight on something that's not really in this case, then you've got to go with it and be prepared for cross-examination. They're going to eat him alive because his statements are inconsistent. He's not anyone who's appealable. The only thing he has going for him is that he's frail, he has some medical conditions, and he's older. So whoever does the cross-examination may annihilate him in a more gingerly way. But they're going to have to annihilate him mm -hmm. because he's opened up that door. Am I humble? Exactly, enough? and let's talk about another part, I'm sure that the prosecutor will eat him alive, uh, is an inconsistency that we that we saw earlier when Durst took the stand he, on Monday. He testified to being there when his mother fell from the roof. I believe he was seven years old and she died. Let's take a listen to that part. Did you see your mother in the driveway? Yes, I saw my mother on the driveway. Yes, you know that, Your Honor. I Douglas Durst says that I could not have seen my mother on the roof from the window in the second floor hallway. Douglas Durst was lying. And there have about, been about a dozen newspaper articles, magazine articles, questioning whether I could have seen my mother on the roof. This testimony contradicts what we heard from Robert Durst's brother, Douglas, earlier in the trial. Let's take a listen to that. You are aware that your brother Bob has claimed that your dad had him view your mom falling slash jumping from the roof. Are you aware of that allegation from your brother? I am aware of that allegation. And do you know, do you have first-hand knowledge of whether that allegation is true? I, I know it's not true because uh, when my uh, mother was in distress, we were brought over to my uh, aunt and uncle's house nearby. 
And can you tell me, you are aware of the way your brother has described having seen this fall or jump, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And given the way the house was laid out and where your brother says he was, is that an accurate depiction of what happened? No, there's, there's no way from inside the house you could see where my mother fell from. Inconsistency after inconsistency. The credibility tank is on empty, I think, Tammy Allison. How do you think possibly the defense can try to fill the tank back up a little bit? Is it even possible? You know, I don't think it's possible for the defense to fill the tank back up. I think the defense is just going to have to distract from all of those inconsistencies. There's no getting around the fact that this man is a liar. He has lied every single time. Different events have come up from his mother to his uh, wife to Susan Berman to him being a mute cross-dresser back in Galveston, Texas. He's a liar. We already know that. But... What is important is the jury and the jury paying attention to if there is enough evidence to convict him in the murder of Susan Berman. Is, are those inconsistencies related to the fact of Susan Berman being murdered? And I think what we've heard and the only real thing that we've heard regarding the inconsistencies as it relates to the murder of Susan Berman is that cadaver note, the block lettering, and him stating on the one hand, he didn't write it. On the second hand, he did write it. And we saw that from the clip from the HBO docuseries, The Jinx. But other than that, there's a lot of inconsistencies. It's, it's undeniable that he is a liar. That's what he's going to do. Right. And once a liar, is it always a liar? CK, can we not trust him on little things or big things here? You know, juries in California, they're a little different. Sometimes you don't know what they're going to do. Um, I want to get your take on whether or not the defense can do anything in its case in chief to help score some points, even with all of these inconsistencies in a jury that may not completely trust Robert Durst. Well, I think what they have to do is not rely on anything Robert Durst has said. They need to not rely on a single thing. He's lied about everything. You know, he lies for no good reason. I mean, he lies about things where there's evidence right in his face where he says something different. That's lying for no good reason in front of a jury. So they cannot rely on him. They almost have to persuade the jury, and this is very difficult. I've only seen it maybe once or twice, that, you know, not to, you know, don't pay too much attention to what he's saying. Let's focus on the hard evidence in this case and what the prosecution cannot prove. Well, that's crazy or not well advised because they chose to put him on the stand. So when you put a defendant on the stand, every single word that that defendant says goes to the credibility of that defendant. They made that choice. No one forced him to. It's risky, but they made that choice and they got to live with it. So he's going to be annihilated on cross-examination. Doesn't matter how they, and they don't have to spend days doing it. They can make a few good, he just, there's just so much, there's just so much to work with there that, you know, they can do it in a way that is ever so mindful of the fact that he's an older gentleman, very sickly and all this other kind of stuff and make the points and sit down. Because I think the jury in listening to him is probably saying, what? But you just said or that doesn't make sense or I don't believe. So he's he's destroying his own case. So I believe the only thing they can do is try to focus on the hard, cold facts. What was what evidence is at the scene? Does that make sense? Poke holes in that because they surely can't rely on what their client has said. And they got to live with the fact that they made a decision to put him on a stand. He probably insisted they may have said no. He said, yes, this is my case. I'm going to do it. I don't know, but I don't think it was a good decision in my impression. I could be wrong. Because I'm not seeing like you the and jury. Tammy agree. And I'm going to agree with you both. I don't know about prosecutor. I think he just maybe can't help himself. He's going to take his time. It's going to, he's going to spend days. I don't think he can keep it short and sweet, but we will be here when it does happen on that cross-examination. It's going to be must 
see television on court TV. And we're going to talk about a different defendant possibly taking the stand next. It's almost time for our top back question. It's about the quadruple murder trial here in North Dakota. The question is, should Chad Isaac take the stand in his own defense? Will it help or hurt his case? We'll have some of your answers from our social media pages right after this quick break. Don't go anywhere. You're watching Court TV Live, and it is time for today's Talk Back segment. Each day we post a question on Court TV's social media pages, and we gather your comments and questions, and we respond right here on the show. So today's question, do you think Chad Isaac will take the stand in his own defense, and will it help or hurt his case? Still with me to talk about it, I have Tammy Allison and C.K. Hockler. All right, let's get to our first Hoffler, I said Hoffler, Hoffler, sorry CK. Uh, first comment of the day is from Kim. And she says, I would love to hear what he has to say. The state would have a filled day. His home and truck didn't look like a professional chiropractor's, not to mention his appearance, put on a jacket. All right, CK, I'll start with you. I kind of agree. I think his appearance means a lot inside a courtroom. I'm in a courtroom almost every day watching different juries all over the nation, and they take note of the defendant, what he or she looks like, and the mannerisms of the defendant, and they often want to hear from the defendant. What do you think? I think his demeanor in the courtroom has been completely inappropriate, quite frankly, for a case like this. He's very casual. Um, he oftentimes, I saw his attorneys kind of almost distance themselves from him, like because his reactions were very, like, you know, all over the place. And and certainly, you know, sometimes you can't control what your client's going to do. But I imagine his attorneys told him about the appropriate decorum, the appropriate behavior, if you will, in a case where you're being tried for not one, not two, not three, but four heinous crimes. And I think that his, his courtroom oh, behavior yeah. is not appropriate. Yeah, so I think he's going, he's not it's gonna be able to help himself. It's a serious matter. It is. He's gonna wanna take the stand. Yeah, yeah. And, he, and I think it's oh, gonna I be think very so too. interesting. Tammy, real quick. Do you think he'll take the stand, Tammy? Listen, I hope he does not. I think that is always not in any defendant's best interest. But as uh, CK pointed out, his demeanor in the courtroom is unsettling for a situation like this where there's four murders and to see his own yes. attorneys uh, kind of distance themselves. Tammy, I hate to cut you off, but I have to go to commercial break. I want to thank you so much, Tammy, and of course, CK, for being with me, being the experts today. Don't go anywhere. Up next, we have closing arguments with Vinnie Paul and Tan. You're watching Court TV, your front row seat to justice. 